This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Like many of you, I was running errands Sunday afternoon when I heard the news coming out of Texas. 26 killed, 20 wounded after a gunman opened fire during a service at First Baptist Church in the small town of Sutherland Springs, Texas. Now this comes a little more than a month since the Las Vegas massacre. Later this hour, we'll hear from Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal on what, if anything, Congress is willing to do to combat gun violence in America. That's later. Also, we revisit the topic of paid family leave. For most Americans, it sounds too good to be true, unless they work for a company like Google or consulting giant Deloitte. Five states already have their own policies, California, New Jersey, our neighbor Rhode Island, New York, Washington State, and the District of Columbia. Will paid family leave ever be a reality for American families, no matter their address? Coming up where we live, we'll hear from director Kai Dickens, who explores the issue in her new documentary, Zero Weeks. Now, speaking of policies impacting millions, overhauling the country's tax code has been an important issue for President Trump and Republicans in Washington. We'll learn more about the House GOP GOP bill released last Thursday and its impact on Connecticut residents, if passed. First, we revisit the casino drama in our region. MGM is on track to open its Springfield Casino. Meanwhile, Connecticut lawmakers and residents in East Windsor have green-lighted a casino in East Windsor to stem the flow of people looking to gamble in the northern part of the state. Now, is this something you're looking forward to or not? You can join the conversation 860-275-7266. You can email us where we live at WMPR.org. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Now, the Matchantucket Pequots and Mohegans have been waiting to see whether their plan would run into any snags on the federal level. Back with an update for us is Ken Gosselin, business reporter for the Hartford Current. Nice to see you again, Ken. Uh, Nice to see you too, Lucy. So let's let's back up a little. I know we've talked about this before, mm-hmm. but it's complicated. Okay. So the state has a gaming compact that both tribes signed uh, back in the, the, the 1990s. 90s. Yeah. Let's talk about that revenue sharing agreement mm-hmm. and why it's important when we talk about this third potential casino in okay. East Windsor. So back in the in the 90s, when the uh, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun got going, um, the state uh, signed agreements with them that called for revenue sharing on the slot revenue. So the way this works is we, you can exclusively run the slots in Connecticut, but we get 25% of the revenue every month. So a very important part of the money that's coming into the state. So that's why these compacts agreements are so important. The, the uh, compact came up with this expansion okay, into East Windsor because um, the the exclusivity, <clears throat> excuse me, for the two tribes, you know, they they are coming together, okay, to run, jointly run this um, venue in East Windsor. But there was some concern that because that is a joint venture and not separate, like the the two agreements that are existing uh, now, it, that it might change that. And there might be problems with that. Um, so that was a very huge issue when the legislature was debating this whole thing. One of many issues, of course, there was the problem gambling. There was just uh, expansion and just in general. But it was a very big issue. So now something has, as you could say, a snag has come up. <laughs> so let's, uh, before we talk about that snag, so the state law that was enacted uh, in this year, I believe, that allows these two tribes mm-hmm. to jointly open the satellite casino mm-hmm. in East Windsor, it required federal approval? Yeah, of the of the change in the compact. So we're back to the compact again. Um, when you make changes to the compact, um, you have to go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is part of the U.S. Department of Interior. And uh, so it was a concern, you know, for revenue. The state needs the revenue that comes from the slots, even though it has been declining in recent years, still needs it, of course. And so all through the debate this past spring, uh, this compact and the uh, approval from the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs kept coming up. Now, the, the tribes kept producing letters, okay, from the BAI on guidance. It wasn't a binding thing, um, saying oh, should be not should not be a problem. Um, and so, you know, they went through the process, okay, you know, the governor signed it, um, and then they brought... A kind of a new agreement that built in the East Windsor mm-hmm. to the BAI. And um, last, uh, let's see, it was in September, they got kind of a curious letter uh, saying they didn't either approve or disapprove. Mm. 
So And so we're talking about this now because they're the deadline passed for them to get any clarification. Right. Well, there's something called the Federal Register where, you know, actions like this must be published by the federal government. OK, so that passed last week. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, kind of looking at like, OK, now what do we do? And the the tribes released a letter on that day um, urging the uh, Bureau to please publish. But they also came with a very interesting argument. They said that according to federal law that governs, you know, uh, the the BIA, that if you don't approve or disapprove, that it is deemed approved. Okay, so this is their argument. They're sending this now back, okay, to the federal government, okay, and urging them to publish. So if while they wait for that, what happens with this satellite uh, casino in East Windsor? Any groundbreaking, any movement? Because we know MGM Springfield is moving along. And that was the whole point, right? To stem the competition from leaving the state and spending dollars in Massachusetts? Exactly. On that day, I was chatting with them, of course, because I you know, wanted to learn more about this. And I said, well, what about the groundbreaking? Are you going to go forward? Because they keep saying they're going to go forward. But and they said, yes, but now nothing has happened. Uh, the chairman of the two tribes told me back in, I think it was May or June, that we wanted to, that they wanted to get going by the end of the year. Okay, so we are, at, for all intents and purposes, at the end of the year. Um, but nothing has happened. So I, it appears that they are really waiting for this, uh, for the BIA to do something. Ken Gosselin's with me in studio, business reporter for the Hartford Current. We're getting an update on that plans from the state and from the Mashantucket Pequots and Mohegan tribes to open this third satellite casino um, in East Windsor. Uh, you know, I'm curious about. Uh, we've seen, I've seen in some of your reporting that there are some legislators that are, that worry that without, uh, you know, more firm uh, letter of what the Bureau of Indian Affairs believes, that this does not violate the gaming compact, that they can't move forward, that they would have to come back to the legislature and amend the gaming compact. Can you talk about that a little? Uh, They could amend the gaming compact, sure, but they they might want to go back and amend the legislation as well, not requiring the BIA's um, uh, uh, approval, okay, because that was written into the legislation. And that's part of what the snag is here, because it's written into law. You've got to have this approval. And then we get this kind of nebulous thing come down that doesn't say one way or another. So it, it, it has thrown a, definitely thrown a wrench into the whole process here. We mentioned MGM Springfield. Uh, you know, I was just in Springfield the other week, and you can see the cranes, construction's moving forward. When will they be opening? Okay, so they uh, have are very firm on September of 2018. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've already started marketing. I was listening to the uh, UConn game on um, on radio um, on um, Saturday, and uh, in pops an ad from MGM saying, "We're coming. You know, we're we're going to we're going to have all this great stuff up in Springfield." So they are already starting to market. And uh, as you uh, correctly mentioned before. the uh, The whole idea of East Windsor was to kind of keep people. Revenue, okay, the you know the slot revenue in Connecticut, so it wouldn't migrate to Springfield. So this is really kind of putting things behind. It definitely is putting things behind. What's the take in the town of East Windsor? What are you hearing from the first selectman, Robert Maynard, and residents about this? Well, I think they are ju- they are waiting like everyone else uh, to hear something that they are uh, ready to get going because they are ready. They say I spoke with uh, Mr. Maynard uh, back about a two weeks ago, I think, and that's what he was saying. Meanwhile, MGM held a press conference uh, just a few weeks ago. They want to open a casino in Bridgeport. Is this a stunt? Yes. Um, Well, they have done some uh, pretty decent groundwork, okay? Um, They have been talking with the developer. It's it's called Steel Point down there, and um, where they're going to be building apartments, and it's a a very large mixed-use development, and this would be a part of it. Um, have been talking for quite a while since June, okay, and they just announced this a little while ago. So it wasn't something like they called up overnight and said, you know, okay, can we do something? We'll throw together some renderings. So whether I can call I don't know if I can call it a stunt necessarily, but it definitely grabbed attention. What lawmakers are on board with this Bridgeport idea? 
Well, of, of course, both the, the mayors, and what is very interesting is that Mayor Ganim and Mayor Harp in New Haven have kind of come together on this, and um, because MGM has promised to do some things in, in uh, New Haven with job training. So they're, they have formed a block down there, and, of course, the legislators, okay, who are in the state would, of course, support that down there as well. And the gaming compact, I mean, if the the tribes say they have exclusivity, so there's no way that a casino could be opened without jeopardizing the gaming compact if they're not the ones operating it? Oh, if MGM, if the, this, what would have to happen, MGM would have to go back to the state legislature because the state legislature is the one who approves expansion. So they'd have to get approval from the state to mm-hmm. do that in, in this next session. Um, so, of course, yes, if they approve that, then all bets are off because, you know, there's no exclusivity anymore. But MGM comes back and says, well, you could do much better if it was in – if the casino was in southwestern Connecticut than south – you know, than doing something up in East Windsor, okay? That there's a, a better market, a more lucrative market between, you know, there and Manhattan, okay, to draw people up. You know, they're talking about, you know, maybe bring people by ferry. I mean, just all this wild stuff. Um, so that's what their argument is. So, yes, you'd lose the exclusivity mm-hmm. if state lawmakers approved the, the Bridgeport deal. But MGM argues that you'd do better. There's also the critique that government shouldn't be relying on gaming uh, to pay the bills. Can mm-hmm. you walk us through uh, what kind of money we're talking about? Because you mentioned that slot revenue has declined, yeah. and that's just why you're seeing the tribes uh, diversifying a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. trying to make it more of a shopping destination or bringing in the big uh, entertainers to, for people to come down there if they don't right. want to be uh, sitting there in front of the slots. That, well, that, that's exactly true. And we have seen the uh, uh, the revenue sharing to the state decline. Uh, fairly significantly f- uh, from where it was originally. It was up in the same maybe 450 million. Now it's down to maybe 270 million. So it has gone down quite a bit. And because, you know, at one point when the when Foxwoods and Mohegan, they were really the only game in town in the Northeast. And over the past 20, 30 years, the, we've seen a lot of expansion of, of um, casino gambling in the Northeast. So it's getting very crowded. Um, so, and even Foxwoods and Mohegan would acknowledge that because they're going into all these other different things. Um, Foxwoods, the, the entertainment, uh, that they have, you know, and, and the, uh, shopping and Mohegan huge on entertainment as well. And, you know, just, uh, outdoor things now because, you know, for many years, casinos were very much an indoor thing. They, they, there weren't even any windows you could see outside. But um, now they're looking to do outdoor sporting. There's just a ton of other things. So even they acknowledge that it has become very crowded. Ken Gosselin, business reporter for the Hartford Current. I have a feeling we're going to have you back in January. Well, <laughs> uh, it could very well be. <laughs> Thank you for coming on and sure. letting us know what's happening uh, with this casino. Again, this potential uh, satellite casino in East Windsor. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, can you imagine filing your taxes by postcard? Could it really be this simple? The idea is part of the tax overhaul legislation unveiled by House GOP lawmakers last Thursday. And the Politico's Colin Wilhelm will have a breakdown for us after the break. First, we're going to talk about uh, that shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas. Senator Blumenthal is on with us as well. You can also join the conversation, 860-275-7266. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to learn more about the tax overhaul bill released late last week by House Republicans. But first, are Americans desensitized by the sheer number of mass shootings in this country? Yesterday, a gunman in Texas opened fire inside a church in the small town of Sutherland Springs, killing 26 and wounding 20. We know members of Connecticut's congressional delegation have been outspoken on the need for change. Joining us now for a few minutes is U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal. Senator Blumenthal, welcome back to the show. Wonderful again to be with you. Thank you. Your reaction to this latest mass shooting, Senator Blumenthal? My stomach turned and my heart broke uh, when I first learned about yet another mass shooting. But we need to keep in mind the people of all ages who perish every day on our streets in all communities. None is safe. That may be one of the lessons here. And my heart and prayers go out to the victims and loved ones, but 
prayers and thoughts are not enough. We need to act. Congress has been complicit. Congress hopefully will now heed this massacre. And my colleagues on both sides of the aisle join in approving background checks and other common sense measures, like barring the kind of assault weapon that was used in this massacre, an AR-15 that was the weapon of choice because it is used to kill people, and we can take steps to make our communities safer by barring them. You said hopefully Congress uh, will move forward, Senator Blumenthal. Do you have hope? I have hope because Congress has acted before in enacting an assault weapon ban. The background check we have now is incomplete. It needs to apply to all sales, private sales, as well as others by gun dealers, and that's the way to make it effective. So we can take steps, and we've introduced the background check bill just uh, about uh, last week, and the other measures like removing the immunity that gun manufacturers now uniquely enjoy, I introduced not long ago. There are measures in the works and more to come, and we came within just a few votes in the wake of the Sandy Hook killing, but not enough has been done. In fact, nothing really has changed since Sandy Hook. President Trump addressed the shooting uh, at a press conference in Tokyo, Japan. Let's hear what he had to say. And I think that uh, mental health is your problem here. This was a, a very, based on preliminary reports, very deranged individual. Had a lot of problems over a long period of time. We have a lot of mental health problems in our country, as do other countries. But this isn't a guns situation. I mean, we could go into it, but it's a little bit soon to go into it. But Fortunately, somebody else had a gun that was shooting in the opposite direction. Otherwise, it would have been as bad as it was. It would have been much worse. Uh, but uh, this is a mental health problem at the highest level. Senator Blumenthal, what's your reaction to what the president is saying? Because mental health has been brought up uh, before, um, and we don't know yet that much about the, this gunman. But he does. he says that it isn't a guns situation. Your reaction to that? Devlin Kelly, the gunman here, apparently was discharged with a bad conduct discharge from the Air Force after he beat his uh, or committed domestic violence against his wife and child and was sent to prison within the military for a year. So he had a history of violence. And the fact is, he may have been afflicted with a mental health issue. I've long advocated better mental health care and parity with physical health care and insurance policies. Ironically, the president's health care repeal and replacement would cut funding for mental health treatment. So we do need to deal with mental health, no question about it, and provide more treatment and better services for people who suffer from mental illness. But the fact of the matter is gun violence protection also demands background checks and other common sense measures that minimize the terrible effects of gun violence and this myth that arming people with more guns will help reduce gun violence is really the worst kind of fiction. And I think Americans generally, in fact, 95 percent of Americans favor background checks. We need to break the grip of the gun lobby, the NRA, on the American Congress and make sure that we make America safer. Yeah, this story is being talked about, especially because of the fact that after the shooting at the church, there are reports that local residents uh, in Sutherland Springs, at least one of them, engaged this gunman with a gun of his own. They, they then chased uh, this uh, gunman, um, uh, pursuing him. I mean, do you feel like this will muddy up the conversation about what needs to change uh, because you had residents uh, trying to stop him with a gun? In the end, he apparently took his own life after he wrecked his car. So I'm hoping that this issue will not confuse the basic message, which is that guns should be kept out of the hands of dangerous people like Devin Kelly or criminals, and that the background check law will help save us from these tragedies. And we're not trying to take guns away from those law-abiding 
neighbors or citizens who sought to apprehend this killer. The Second Amendment gives them that right, and as a lawyer, as well as a citizen, I respect the Second Amendment, but the fact is that dangerous people and killers have too many of these weapons, particularly assault weapons, which are not used for hunting or recreation. They're used essentially to kill and maim people, principally in combat. Uh, Last month, I spoke to Professor David Hemingway from Harvard School of Public Health, and that was just after the Las Vegas massacre. Um, And he stresses, um, among other of his colleagues, that it's not a good idea that we talk about gun control because, again, uh, there's a part of our country that will see this as an argument the government's looking to take away their guns. Rather, this should be looked at as a public health crisis. How can that be done in a more uh, a, a strong way in Washington, where we hear that it's a public health crisis and not just about uh, taking away someone's gun? It is a public health crisis. It's an epidemic of gun violence. Think of it this way. If 90 people every day perished from some infectious disease, there would be an outcry, an outrage, much as there was in the Ebola disease emergency, which took uh, a handful of lives in this country, but posed a danger. And we need to recognize the same danger from gun violence and talk about it in those terms, as well as a public safety issue, which is why our police and law enforcement are so dedicated to this cause as well. They face these guns, often stolen or lost in their work every day, and some of them become victims of gun violence because criminals have these guns. So better enforcement, stronger laws will help save lives. Senator Blumenthal, it's November. Uh, We're about to talk about this tax overhaul bill. Uh, There's a deadline that they want to get it passed before the end of the year. Is it likely that anything talking about gun violence in this country, whether it's a a mass shooting or someone down the street in Hartford or Bridgeport, is that really going to be talked about on the floor uh, before the end of the year? Will we see any kind of action? I will talk about it on the floor. I know other colleagues will, like Senator Booker, of New Jersey and uh, my colleague and friend, Senator Murphy, and I, who have been a team on this issue since Sandy Hook. I was an advocate of gun violence prevention when I was attorney general shortly after I was elected in the 1990s and defended in court myself, argued it, and tried the case, the assault weapon ban that was adopted then in Connecticut. So I've been a longtime advocate. I'm going to continue. We're not going away. We're not giving up, and we have grassroots organizations here in Connecticut and around the country like Sandy Hook Promise and the Newtown Action Alliance that have been at our side, the the Connecticut Coalition Against Gun Violence. Uh, These kinds of organizations provide the energy and support we need. We're going to continue talking on the floor and in communities and all around the country. Connecticut U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, thank you for calling in today. Thank you so much. Take care. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, and you can keep listening to WNPR and NPR News throughout the day for more on that shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas. Now, we're shifting now to an issue that lawmakers are interested in dealing with, and that's the tax code. Today, lawmakers are marking up the $1.5 trillion tax overhaul bill released by Congressional House Republicans just days ago. President Trump has signaled he wants to sign this bill into law by Christmas. Is that realistic? And who stands to gain the most from changes to the tax code? What part of the bill are you for or against? You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. On the phone with us is Colin Wilhelm, financial and economic reporter for Politico. Colin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I wanted to talk first about this uh, idea that the process, this bill, will really simplify filing taxes, even this idea of sending in a postcard. Can you talk about that part of uh, the announcement last week, Colin? Sure. Uh, Republicans have actually backed off the postcard just slightly. They say now that you could do it, probably do your taxes on a single worksheet. Uh, But essentially what they are offering is a doubling of the standard deduction, which is the deduction that people can take instead of itemizing their returns, uh, instead of taking, say, a deduction for mortgage interest or other items. uh, And doubling that in order to simplify the code, Uh, That way they can eliminate all of these other breaks and deductions 
And that helps pay for lowering the rates across the board. And with that uh, double in the standard deduction, you could see a big chunk of people who itemize sticking with the, the standard deduction? Yes. Uh, that's something that the housing lobby in particular has been concerned about for a while. Uh, even though the proposed Republican tax bill would keep the mortgage interest deduction, it would cut it in half. And also by doubling the standard deduction, they're worried that uh, very few people will actually take that. And then uh, basically we'll see a, their, their fear is that we'll see a decline in home sales. This uh, bill also includes lowering the corporate tax rate significantly. Can you talk, walk us through that? Sure. So the U.S. does have a um, exceptionally high corporate tax rate. Um, basically, part of the, the mission in this current tax reform push has been to get that lower and to put it more mm-hmm. on level with other developed countries. So the proposed rate would drop from uh, 35%, which is what it currently is now, to 20%. And then there's also uh, this new challenge that Republicans are wrestling with right now, which is what to do with closely held businesses that don't necessarily qualify as C corporations. They're not big companies by and large. They're family owned or they're small businesses or sometimes they're private equity or, or hedge funds that just are held by a few people. So it's a really wide swath of businesses. And what they're planning to do is drop them from what they're currently taxed at, which is an individual rate, to a 25% rate. But that becomes really tricky because when you cut those taxes, you have to try to do it in a way that uh, basically the do it so that the, the system can't be gained, uh, that there won't you won't be creating a new loophole. We are hearing that uh, Connecticut is among um, several states that are a little worried about uh, eliminating uh, the state and local tax deductions. Uh, could this be a make or break for whether this bill even moves forward in the House? And can you walk well, us it, through the concerns? Sure. Uh, Republicans from the Northeast in particular, uh, especially New York, um, are extremely concerned about this. I should say New York and New Jersey are extremely concerned about this, and uh, several withheld their votes on the budget resolution that was key to advancing uh, tax reform. Because of this concern, um, there's some uh, speculation that it could end up being a net tax increase on some of their constituents because they'd no longer be able to deduct those state and local taxes paid. Um, So that's a major political consideration within this bill uh, and something that uh, certainly House Speaker Paul Ryan Um, And the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Kevin Brady, are concerned that they need to get those votes from those uh, Republicans in northeastern states in order to advance this tax bill. If they don't, then their uh, their margin for error is extremely thin. Mm. Let's walk us – please walk us through some of the other deductions. So I think we mentioned um, mortgage interest deduction, but also student loan interest deductions. I mean, how are they – how are the Republicans planning on paying for that $1.5 trillion uh, lost uh, revenue? So basically by getting rid of these specialized deductions uh, and by doubling the standard deduction, they think that most people won't feel an effect. Uh, But this is why tax reform has been hard and why it hasn't been done in, in about a generation uh, is because you have to, in order to pay for these lower rates for these tax cuts, you have to then get rid of popular provisions like the student loan interest deduction or the medical expense deduction. Or um, they're also talking about getting rid of an adoption tax credit. Um, Basically, simplifying the entire code comes at a cost and, and lowering those rates comes at a cost. You mentioned a medical expense deduction. I mean, how many people actually uh, file that? Well, so that's up for debate right now. Um, And that's certainly, I think you'll see that debate heat up on Capitol Hill. Uh, In order to qualify for it, a person has to pay out-of-pocket medical expenses of over 10% of their annual income. Uh, But the problem is a lot of, that means a lot of retirees qualify for that if they're drawing a certain amount of money uh, and then paying for expensive health care services. Um, so that's one, of the, that's one of the challenges with trying to do tax reform is when you simplify the code, when you get rid of some of these deductions, you end up 
taking away something that someone uses and uh, you're hoping that uh, what you give them in, in lower rates and a, maybe a, in this case a doubling of the standard deduction, uh, that that's going to be enough to offset that uh, loss. This is where we live on the phone with us, Colin Wilhelm, financial and economic reporter for Politico. We're talking about the tax overhaul bill unveiled by House Republicans last week. I believe today the tax writing committee starts marking up the bill. If you have a question about how this bill impact or how this bill will impact uh, you, especially here in Connecticut, 860-275-7266. There were concerns earlier about um, putting away savings in 401k plans. How is that addressed in this bill, Colin? So they're actually not touching that. That was sort of a last-minute um, debate over whether or not to include a change in the tax treatment. Now, just because they're, they didn't touch that in this initial draft doesn't mean that won't be introduced again sometime in the near future. But basically what that would have done was change the current treatment of 401ks. Right now they're pre-tax, so that's you're not taxed on the dollars that you then put in your 401k retirement account in a traditional 401k. Um, but then you're taxed on the back end when you take that money out. Now, what Republicans wanted to do in order to help, or at least some Republicans wanted to do in order to help pay for this tax reform plan was change that treatment of the money that's deposited into those 401k accounts from pre-tax to post-tax. So you'd be taxed on your uh, retirement saving going in, but then give a tax break on the way out. Um, there was some criticism over that for multiple reasons, uh, one of which is it's just very sensitive to make any changes to how people save their money for retirement. Uh, but also there were some accusations that this was a bit more of a budget gimmick than something that would really pay for lower rates in the long term. At the end of the day, Colin, who are the big winners and losers? So certainly... Um, Higher income earners will see a uh, most of them will see an overall uh, tax cut. Uh, also, companies in theory, businesses are pushing this really hard in order to uh, what they say is is this makes them more competitive with their international uh, competition, and this would allow them to uh, invest and create more jobs. Um, and a lot of middle income folks too uh, will see an overall tax cut. Um, it's going to be up for debate, and it's still, since this is a, a very complicated thing, you're essentially reorganizing the entire U.S. economy. Uh, it's something that will continue to be analyzed and scrutinized and really debated uh, over the course of the next several weeks and potentially months. Meanwhile, uh, the U.S. Senate's going to come up with their own version. What can we expect coming from them? So they will be a little bit less aggressive than the House version. They have a different set of budget rules that they have to work with, um, and that means that they can't factor in economic growth in the same way that the House can through an independent committee that basically analyzes every single uh, primary and secondary impact of the tax reform bill. But for the Senate to uh, to pass this, they have to... Uh, make sure that they're not adding to the deficit more than $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. Uh, and that's already starting to raise concerns among budget hawks. Uh, just over the weekend, uh, Senator James Lankford from Oklahoma said that he would currently be a no on tax reform. And uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has very few votes to work with over there. So this is that's a major news for him and, and his vote counters. So I started the segment talking about how President Trump wants to see uh, the bill on his desk by Christmas. That's unlikely? I think it's unlikely, it, but in order for tax reform to pass in this iteration, it probably has to keep very fast momentum. And right now, uh, it does seem to have that. I think we'll have a better sense of whether it can keep that momentum over the course of this week and as more people uh, examine and analyze the bill. Colin Wilhelm is financial and economic reporter for Politico. We'll tweet out some of your stories at Where We Live. Colin, thanks for the breakdown. Thanks so much for having me on. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, will paid family leave ever be a reality in this country? Documentarian Kai Dickens explores that question in her new film, Zero Weeks. She'll join us after the break. This is Where We Live.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, much of Puerto Rico remains devastated six weeks after Hurricane Maria. Some families have relocated to the mainland. On the next where we live, how is Connecticut welcoming them to our state? The Connecticut Mirror reports 500 students from Puerto Rico have started classes in several local public school districts. Is your relative one of them? You can join the conversation tomorrow on Where We Live. Now, paid family leave, for most Americans, it sounds too good to be true unless they work for a company like Google or consulting giant Deloitte. Five states, California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, New York, and Washington State and the District of Columbia have their own paid leave policies. Will this ever be a reality for American families? Kai Dickens joins us now, director of a new documentary out focusing on paid family leave. Kai, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So you have done several documentaries. Tell us why you decided to talk and focus on paid leave. Sure. Well, a lot of my films are rooted or inspired by something that happens in real life. And I had never thought about paid leave until I had a daughter. Um, And I'd been with the same small company, a small production company, for 11 years. And I was the first woman to get pregnant there. And, you know, at the time they told me, you know, it's a small company. We don't have to do anything and we're going to see what we can do. Um, and they were able to, you know, uh, offer me two weeks of, of paid family leave. And I remember thinking, how are we going to do this? Like, I can't have a baby and be back in two weeks. And so I fought for more time um, and asked for more time. And that became almost kind of a contentious thing, I think, with the company to a certain degree, where I started to wonder if my job was even stable by me asking for my, more time. And I and did end up getting more time, but during that time it was unpaid and it was very hard and we went through our savings. And it was just sort of a wake-up call. Um, that I was one of the lucky ones, and there's people, you know, one in four women in America go back to work um, within 10 days of having a baby. And then I also kind of uh, woke to the fact that this is not just about parental leave, this is about mm-hmm. leave if you are sick or if you have a spouse who is sick or injured or a child who, God forbid, is hit by a car or has some chronic illness, or, of course, if you have an aging parent who just needs time for three weeks, four weeks, and you want to keep your job. So, um Suddenly I realized that this is a crisis that affects everyone and there hadn't been a feature film on it. And as we all know, stories help um, put the face on an issue. And I decided to make a film. So when we, we've talked about this before on the show, but just to reiterate you know, that the U.S. really is, stands alone with not, um, besides I think it's Guam and Oman, uh, maybe not Guam, but Oman and uh, what was the other one, Papua New Guinea, well, where they have their own, they don't have paid leave policies, but other countries do? Yeah, yeah, and actually now it's only the Amer- uh, the United States mm-hmm. and Papua New Guinea. So Guam has entered the category of paid leave. So really, we are the only industrialized country and one of only two countries in the entire world, which is why the title of the film, Zero Weeks, um, is what it is, because you know we have a big map in the film that shows all these countries, Pakistan, China, Afghanistan, Russia, you know, Suriname, Chad, that have great family leave. And here we are in the United States, zero. The UK offers 40 weeks of paid maternity leave. Ireland, Vietnam, 26 weeks. Uh, 70 countries offer paid paternity leave, and that's uh, courtesy of the International Labor Organization in Geneva. So talk us through who you profile, and do you also bring in the business perspective? Because we hear that often in, in, in our mm-hmm. state when we're talking about whether or not we should have paid family leave, and you hear from certain employers who say they worry that they'll have employees that take advantage of the system. How do you reflect that in your film? Yeah, well, the business perspective is a, a very important thread in the film, you know, because obviously this has to make our country whole, it has to keep businesses afloat. And what we have found time and time again is that businesses um, want paid family leave, they support it. Uh, there is actually a recent uh, poll in Connecticut that showed that 77% of small businesses support it and want to see paid leave enacted because it helps them, you know, keep up with the bigger businesses. And, and you know, one of the points we make in the film is paid leave is not a tax increase, and it's not on the responsibility of the employer. It works like any other type of insurance. So think of car insurance or home insurance. You as an employee, as a worker, uh, as a citizen, puts a little bit of your paycheck away. And, and in, most, in the states where it's enacted, it's about the cost of a cup of coffee a week, so you know, a few bucks. Um, and then that money is there when you need it. Um, and the only reason the government really needs to be involved is just to protect these jobs, you know, so that if, if God forbid, uh, you get sick, you have a spouse who has a heart attack or is injured, or you have a new baby, or you need to take care of an aging parent for a moment, you have the ability to do so and 
you know, keep your job and therefore keep your health insurance. And what we're, we're finding in many states, I mean, this is like the ultimate conservative value in many ways. I think a lot of people think of paid leave as a progressive issue, and it's not. I mean, this is preserving families. It's keeping people attached to the workforce. It's people keeping people's savings in check. They're not using it for a crisis or something like a baby. Um, and it keeps employees more productive, more loyal. When Google passed paid leave, you know, people talk about Google all the time. They didn't have paid leave forever. And when they increased their paid leave, attrition went down by 50 percent when patagonia passed paid leave they had a hundred percent of their workers the following year after they passed paid leave who had gone out and had you know had baby or had to take sick time so you know it's been proven over and over again that this works and um another just quick small business fact california has had paid leave longer than any other state in the nation when California was debating whether or not they should have paid leave, there was a large discussion about, you know, the sky will fall, this is going to be horrible for businesses. And since that time, they went back and polled small businesses in California, and most of, 90, over 90% of those businesses have said it had either positive effect or no effect on their bottom line at all. Because um, time after time, you see it just, you know, again, it, it creates more industrious, productive, um, loyal workers. And for small businesses in particular, um, I think people are, are, you know, very, it becomes a family and, and people don't abuse it. There's been no proof of that in any of the research that's been done. Kai Dickens is on the phone with us, writer and director of the new documentary Zero Weeks. Uh, one of the women you profile, Kai, is Jasmine. She's a mother living in Maryland. Can you briefly tell us about her situation? Then we'll hear a clip. Sure. Um, yeah, Jasmine uh, was working at a daycare when we met her. She's been there for five years. She absolutely loved that job. And you know, it was a small business. It was basically Jasmine and her employer. And when she said she was going to have a baby, her employer couldn't do anything, not at a fault of her own. Most small businesses can't, which is why obviously people are hoping for for there to be a a public policy allowing uh, small business owners to be able to do this. So anyway, Jasmine um, uh, doesn't have any maternity leave. She's worried about um, how she's going to take care of this baby. She wants to get back to work immediately. And her boss has to hire someone um in the interim and jasmine is afraid that if she doesn't get back to work quick enough she's going to lose her job because maybe that boss will start to like this other woman better than her you know she's got a lot of fear that a new mother has and she's also that fear of wanting to stay home with her baby and uh, you know i don't want to give away the whole movie but we see how the lack of paid leave really negatively impacts her life she ends up unemployed and on food stamps which just really quick brings up another point about paid leave that has been shown that women are 40 percent less likely to be on food stamps if their state has paid leave. I want to hear a little of Jasmine. Here's a clip from your film, Zero Weeks. My head is everywhere right now. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's very important to me to actually work and make money. I think I'll probably be having to go back to work early as three weeks after I have her. If she hires somebody else in my place, she might actually start to really like her. And, you know, the kids might really gravitate to her and I might not have a job to come back to after I have her. So that's really a big issue for me right now. I was curious how FMLA uh, would impact someone like Jasmine. She's worried about, you know, another worker possibly taking her place. But doesn't FMLA protect her job, Kai? So that's the one thing that I found to be the greatest, you know, confusion with paid leave out there is is what the FMLA is and, and who it covers. So the FMLA is unpaid leave. The majority of Americans almost 8 in 10 can't take FMLA. Um, one, because they can't afford it. Most Americans are living, you know, paycheck to paycheck or nearly paycheck to paycheck. So to go for a certain amount of time without pay is really hard. But beyond that, there's a few restrictions about the FMLA that many people don't realize. One is that you have to work for a company of 50 or more employees. That's a huge company. We know that most companies in this country are small companies that don't have 50 or more. So right there, a lot of workers are not covered by the FMLA. Beyond that, you have to work practically full-time, and you have to have been there for over a year. So there's a lot of stipulations that knock out more than 50% of the workforce from even being able to be considered for FMLA. But beyond that, if you can take FMLA, it's unpaid, which, again, doesn't help you out too much if you're if you're um, barely scraping by and have to go through all of your savings just to have a baby or to deal with a life event. You profile another woman. And again, when we talk about paid family leave, it's not just about uh, couples having uh, new babies, but also all of us at some point will have to consider um, how to take care of our elderly parents. And you profile a woman named Donna. Here she is. It's a struggle trying to go to work plus take care of my mom. 
paid leave would have helped me out a tremendous amount. I could have spent more time caring for her and taking her where she needs to go. It was very, very difficult for me as well as my family. And Kai, we know that we have an aging population, especially here in New England. There's not enough health professionals to keep up with the demand. It's expensive. Uh, people don't adequately plan or maybe they don't have the resources uh, to deal with long-term care plans. Uh, was it hard for you to find people that want to talk about this point because there's always that emphasis on the new babies? No, I don't think so, because this is a looming crisis facing America, unlike anything we've faced before. And I know that sounds really dramatic, but it's true. Within 10 years, one in five Americans are going to be over the age of 65. Right now, we don't have enough supports in place to care for the aging seniors that we have, let alone the crisis of, of the aging baby boomers. And if you think about it, often when we think about aging and needing to take care of a parent, we think of the two worst case scenarios. We're either putting them into a retirement home or they're dying. And the reality is, usually it's maybe a knee replacement where they need help three, three weeks in a row going back and forth to physical therapy or they're having an eye surgery where they need someone with them for you know 10 days in a row or five days in a row. Those are the ways that paid leave can really help keep our aging seniors in place in their home where they do better, where they stay healthier longer, where it's more affordable. Because in-care um, nursing as well as, you know, like the nursing home facility costs thousands of dollars, between forty and $80,000 for either of those options. So, you know, being able to be able to care for our aging seniors by taking three weeks off, four weeks off, knowing that your job will be protected is so crucial for what America is about to be going through as our baby boomers age. I mentioned the states uh, and the District of Columbia that have uh, passed paid leave policies. How did they make it work? What were the talking points that got lawmakers and others together to say this is a benefit that people should have? Well, the, the first three states that passed paid leave had temporary disability insurance. And that's another myth. A lot of people think, oh, I have disability insurance. I'll have a baby. I'll just go on disability. That is not (laughs) the case. There were three states that had temporary disability insurance, and those were the first three states to pass paid family medical leave, California, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. And the reason that was possible was because that system was already in place, right? There was a system there for um, collecting uh, money from people's paychecks and and letting them take the time off if they needed it. Again, what we found in those states is it it has had no negative impact on business, and it's had a very positive effect on families, on marriages, on, um, on, in, on, on just personal uh, responsibility savings and that type of thing. Um, so the way that those states do it is a small portion is taken out of the employee's paycheck. Um, like I said before, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, it's usually about the, cup, the cost of a cup of coffee a week, and so 2 to $3 out of a paycheck, and then that goes into a fund and there when you need it. Um, different states have different levels of leave. So originally when Rhode Island passed paid leave, they had four weeks of paid leave. A lot of those states that have passed such a small amount are going back and revisiting and saying, you know what, we need to have a gold standard, which is really 12 weeks minimum. minimum. Because in, compared to the rest of the world, 12 weeks is actually nothing. Nothing. And so 12 weeks should be the minimum. Another thing that, you know, we're trying to make sure that people understand as we debate these policies, 20, 20 states are now considering paid family medical leave bills. And the thing to remember is income replacement is always a part of that policy. So how much income is someone being paid while they're out? And what's really important is for the lowest income earner to have the highest income replacement because in a few states that pass it, and again, they're going back to correct it, income replacement was so low that for people living paycheck to paycheck, they couldn't take paid leave, which therefore it meant only rich people could enjoy time with their baby or an aging senior or a sick spouse and the, and the poorest of us we're still going back to work within days of having a C-section. Hi, we're going to have to leave it there. You mentioned 20 states are looking at paid family leave. That's including Connecticut. Your documentary, Zero Weeks, is going to be screened at the New York premiere this Saturday as part of Doc NYC. Also, there's going to be information on our website, wmpr.org, slash where we live, of where Connecticut residents can see screenings of Zero Weeks. Kai Dickens, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Today's show produced by senior producer Lydia Brown. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Our special thanks to our WNPR interns who helped screen our calls. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.